Number 8. K-27 The Russian authorities are investigating whether a sunken Soviet nuclear-powered submarine, the K-27, can be safely raised so that crews can remove the uranium in its reactors. In 1968, at the height of the Cold War, the K-27 met with disaster when radiation leaked from one of its reactors during an excursion in the Arctic. While to some people it makes sense to use a nuclear power source for military submarines, to others it makes little sense from an environmental one. A good, or should we say a bad example of this, was the K-27, an old Soviet attack sub from the 1960s. It was just over 360 feet long and weighed 4,380 tons below the surface. Factor in a traveling speed of 30.2 knots, and this is one big hunk of metal you wouldn't want to run into under the sea. The sub was powered by two VT-1 reactors, which the Soviets described as experimental. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, actually, it wasn't. It was probably a red-hot ticking time bomb. A liquid metal coolant played a significant role in the operation of these reactors. Can you believe this vessel was sent out with a crew who reportedly hadn't received any extensive training? This appears to have been an accident waiting to happen, and sure enough, it did. Radioactive gas leaked into the sub, resulting in the deaths of nine crew members from radiation exposure. The K-27 made it back to base, but by the early 1980s it was clear to the Russians that serious measures needed to be taken. The Soviets sealed off the reactor compartments and scuttled it into the Kara Sea in a move that would shock environmentalists everywhere. Scuttling is where a seagoing vessel is deliberately sunk by its owners. This happened at a depth of only 108 feet, reportedly way too shallow for that kind of dangerous material. Last we heard, the K-27 would be removed from its watery grave because of a new Russian government initiative. Here's hoping that happens sooner rather than later. You don't want a bunch of radioactive material just sitting in the water, sealed away or not. Number 7. U-864 World War II may be yesterday's news, but it's important to remember that the fallout from that conflict is still felt by people today. In the Norwegian Sea, there's an island in an area known as Vestland County. In 2003, they received a nasty surprise after discovering that a Nazi-era submarine had sunk in the water decades earlier. The really nasty part was its cargo. Among its goodies were Japanese airplane components and nearly 2,000 barrels of mercury for military use. Unfortunately, that mercury had apparently been leaking out and contaminating the local sea life. Not something you want to think about when biting into a crab salad, right? The U-864 was launched in 1943 and met its end because of a British torpedo attack less than a couple of years later. This was during part of Operation Caesar, an effort to transport deadly materials to their allies. The sub was just over 287 feet long and weighed 1,799 tons once underwater. It moved at a speed of almost 7 knots in action. There were 73 German crew members aboard who lost their lives. The British sub HMS Venturer carried out the attack, which is thought to be the first below-the-surface face-off in history. In the 21st century, with the grim discovery came a major debate on how to handle this truly toxic situation. The U-864 lies 499 feet down, and eventually a decision was made by authorities to bury the sub in sand underwater. This was supposed to have happened by 2020. However, it didn't appear to have taken place. According to environmentalists, the move is a controversial one who insists that mercury will continue to leak anyway, continuing to threaten marine life in the vicinity. It seems whatever people do, contamination will occur in the local ecosystem. Even the act of moving what are now very rusty barrels brings challenges. We don't envy their situation and wish them luck in resolving the dilemma as quickly as possible. What do you think is the best disposal method for nuclear waste? Number 6. K-219 in 1986, a Soviet submarine sank off the coast of Bermuda. It was an alarming enough situation, but one made even more frightening because it carried nukes. The K-219 is described as a second-generation vessel and has been used for this purpose since 1971. Measuring 425 feet long and 38 feet wide, it had a top speed of 26 knots. According to reports, the ballistic missiles were R-27s, and the sub carried no less than 16 of them at the time it went down, according to reports. So why did it go down? One of the K-219's missile tubes developed a leak and started taking on seawater. Not a good thing because despite subs being in seawater all the time, there are elements such as fuel inside the tubes that can create devastating reactions if exposed to it. Add an electrical charge and you have a recipe for an explosion. The crew reportedly wasn't organized enough to access or deal with the problem. It was possible to empty the missile tube using a pump, but that short-circuited and sparked, resulting in a big bang. After three days of trying to rescue the sub, it had to be abandoned. 
The captain and his men made it out, though sadly three crew members lost their lives. At one point, an attempt was made to tow the K-219, but the line snapped. There were a lot of international intrigues. While the United States was concerned about the Soviet crew members' safety and understood the critical situation, old tensions remained. The Russians had lost a nuclear submarine and their enemies might access this. A movie about the real-life drama starring Martin Sheen titled Hostile Waters was released a decade or so later. The K-219 is currently 18,000 feet down in an area of the North Atlantic called the Hatteras Abyssal Plain. We still don't know if the Russians plan to retrieve their sub. Number 5. USS Scorpion The USS Scorpion was a skipjack-class attack scub that sank under mysterious circumstances in the North Atlantic in 1968. After not returning home to Virginia, the vessel was eventually located by a team several months later. This gives it the dubious honor of being one of only two nuclear submarines lost at sea by the Americans. What was the other one? Well, we'll talk about that one soon enough. Also referred to as SSN-589, the Scorpion was 251 feet long with a 31-foot beam. It was powered by an S-5W nuclear reactor and carried Mark 45 or Aster nuclear torpedoes. So how come it wound up thousands of feet down in the ocean? To this day, people aren't sure. A blast resulting from an accidental buildup of hydrogen is thought to be the primary culprit. It may also have been that the Soviets attacked the Scorpion. The sub was there to engage the enemy, after all. Another theory states a torpedo may have blown up while still inside the vessel. Or on a similar note, could the Scorpion have launched a torpedo inadvertently and struck itself? Was a faulty trash disposal unit to blame, allowing water to flood the compartments? All kinds of explanations spring up in the wake of a tragedy like this. 99 souls were reportedly lost. Speaking of unexplained, the Scorpion tragedy received added attention because it took place in the same year as three other submarines that went missing. Should we continue to use nuclear power, or is it too risky? Is there a better alternative? Share your ideas in the comments. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 4. K-8 Lying 15,000 feet down in the Bay of Biscay, Europe is the Soviet submarine K-8. It's an authentic part of Russian military history, though not exactly in a good way. The K-8 was one of the first Soviet subs known as the November class. These vessels were powerful but made a lot of noise, which ultimately limited how they could be used in combat. The sub began operation in 1960, and it carried smaller nuclear warheads intended to be fired at enemy transport convoys. The K-8 was bearing four such torpedoes when it was cruising in the Bay of Biscay as part of a huge Soviet war game known as Okean 70. At 352 feet long, 26 feet wide, and with an underwater speed of 30 knots, it made a powerful addition to the fleet, even if you could hear it coming from a distance. What happened? A surprising amount of stuff involving submarines involves accidents, especially with a relatively untested type of craft. The November class was an early Russian nuclear attack sub, so not something you were aboard for the fun of it. It reportedly suffered a radiation-based accident not long after taking to the water in the 60s, and an even worse situation was waiting for the following decade. Not just one, but two fires on board resulted in an evacuation. Yet this wasn't straightforward. Eight crewmen sadly died, and the Russians couldn't just leave a big nuclear submarine to sink. As with the K-219 we mentioned earlier, it took an incredible three days to try and rescue the K-8. Its reactors were closed down, and it had no power, so the Navy needed to go in there and grab it. Tragically, the weather was not on their side, making the mission too challenging. Worst of all, there were dozens of men aboard when the vessel finally went down. Reports vary in terms of numbers, but it's believed around 50 men lost their lives on the ship. The warheads sank along with them, as the team could not reach them in time. Thankfully, 73 men survived. Number 3. K-278 Komsomolets The K-278 Komsomolets was a Soviet attack sub that sank in the Barents Sea, part of the Arctic Ocean, back in 1989. Measuring 385 feet long and 35 feet wide, it had a top speed of 30 knots while submerged. How did it end its days 5,512 feet below the surface? The answer is another example of just how dangerous it can be to pilot a nuclear submarine at sea. A fire was triggered when air hoses came loose and acted almost as deadly weapons, damaging a fuel section and creating a short circuit. The sub went into emergency mode with reactors shutting down. If the crew weren't careful, they'd sink. Drastic action needed to be taken, so ballast tanks were ditched, enabling the ship to float to the surface. The blaze still needed to be tackled. Nine men died during the catastrophe. After a matter of hours, it became clear the cause was lost. Most of the crew had abandoned the ship and were at the mercy of the freezing water. Things were so dangerous that the four men who stayed on board with the captain had to get out of the sub using an escape capsule. Sadly, only one man made it to the surface alive.
As for the rest of the crew, 30 died and 27 survived. Number 2. USS Thresher Earlier we talked about the tragedy of the USS Scorpion in 1968. That situation altered the US Navy's practices concerning American nuclear subs. But there was another case that led to the changes as well. It happened five years later aboard the USS Thresher. The subs sank in the Atlantic Ocean near Cape Cod while in the middle of a training exercise. The first of the Thresher class was 279 feet long and 32 feet wide. It reportedly had a maximum speed of 33 knots. Often you'll see two descriptions of a submarine's speed, one for above the surface and the other for below. Subs move faster under the water, which obviously makes sense. However, the thing about nuclear subs is they don't have to rise to the surface unless something is wrong. The Thresher possessed a teardrop-shaped hole to aid momentum down in the depths. After being made aware that the sub was in trouble during the training exercise, authorities lost contact with the Thresher. They later discovered six separate pieces of the sub. 129 men aboard lost their lives, with 17 of those being outside contractors. The base picked up the sound of rushing air after the vessel reported issues, but aside from that, it wasn't clear why the ship went down the way it did. A classified investigation was carried out, but the public didn't get a fuller picture until 2020 when legal action was taken to make the Navy release the documents. The services report stated that a single loose pipe was behind the sinking. The files also revealed a sequence of problems. These included sloppy welding and an alleged lack of thorough training for the men. The construction of the sub was apparently undertaken with haste, which it's believed relates to Soviet military developments and a desire to beat them in the arms race. Number 1. Kursk Probably the most well-known nuclear submarine in the world right now is the Kursk. As well as making headlines back in 2000, it's also been the subject of major motion pictures. The Kursk measured 505 feet long and 60 feet wide. The Russian Oscar II class sub sank approximately 350 feet in the Barents Sea following an onboard explosion. 118 crew members died, while 23 survived longer than the others. What happened? It's widely reported that a torpedo leaked a volatile propellant inside the sub, resulting in the disaster. Even more tragically, it took Russian authorities far too long to reach the craft, with unnecessary delays and an unwillingness to bring in other nations in order to help with the rescue. The situation is regarded as a shocking case of mismanagement on behalf of the Kremlin. However, those in charge have maintained that there was more to the sinking than met the eye, and that a collision with an enemy sub led to the tragedy. If you were stationed on a nuclear sub, who would you want to be there with you? Number 9. Escape to South America When the Third Reich fell, as many as 9,000 Nazi officers and collaborators fled from Europe to South America, where they took on new identities and started new lives, hoping to evade accountability for their war crimes. The vast majority of them, around 5,000, moved to Argentina, while somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 fleeing Germans went to Brazil, and another 500 to 1,000 settled in Chile. Argentina had close ties with Germany before the war, and had remained mostly neutral throughout the conflict, making it an ideal place for wanted criminals to go. The country's president, Juan Perón, helped smuggle thousands of Nazis out of Europe by ordering intelligence officers and diplomats to establish escape routes through ports in Spain and Italy. He also recruited former Third Reich members with skills that he thought might benefit his government. Some Vatican officials unknowingly helped war criminals who they believed were Catholic refugees, while others did it with full awareness by providing them with false identity documents. Many of the Nazis who went to South America never faced justice and lived comfortably for the rest of their lives. Among them were SS Colonel Walter Rolf, whose mobile gas chambers killed about 100,000 Holocaust victims, and Dr. Josef Mengele, nicknamed the Angel of Death. He went down in history for his gruesome medical experiments he performed on Auschwitz prisoners, including children. Most times, officials never discovered these individuals' real identities. There were also instances where authorities refused to expedite an accused war criminal back to Europe. Number 8. Capturing the Most Wanted Nazi the South American countries where some Nazis fled weren't always complicit in giving up accused war criminals, forcing those who sought justice to come up with creative ways to capture them so they could face trial. One of the key organizers of the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann, fled to Argentina in 1950 where he lived under the alias Ricardo Clement. He took his family with him, settled in a middle-class suburb, and got a job at a Mercedes-Benz factory. In 1957, Israel's intelligence agency, Mossad, received a tip about Eichmann's whereabouts and his new identity. 
Three years later, as Argentina's 150th anniversary of its revolution against Spain drew enormous crowds of tourists, Mossad smuggled agents into the country unnoticed. Knowing the government might not cooperate with plans to extradite Eichmann, they kidnapped him while he walked home from the bus stop. The agents drugged the man, disguised him as an incapacitated Israeli airline employee who had suffered head trauma in an accident, and flew him to Israel. Argentina demanded Eichmann's return, but Israel refused. Eichmann claimed he was just following orders, but the courts found him guilty of 15 war crimes and sentenced him to death. The Israelis hung him near Tel Aviv in 1962. Number 7. Some were caught decades later. Officials have brought many aging former Nazis to justice in recent years, despite their frail condition, including Friedrich Karl Berger, a former concentration camp guard who had resettled in Tennessee. A judge ordered his deportation back to Germany under the Holtzman Amendment, which bans participants of Nazi persecution from living in the United States. Berger arrived back in Germany at the age of 95, making him the 70th former Nazi to be deported from the U.S. A court determined that he willingly guarded prisoners and did not request the transfer to another job position. It was also found that he was still receiving a pension from Germany for his wartime service. Just a few years earlier, former Nazi labor camp guard Yakiv Pali was removed from his home in Queens by ICE agents. The 95-year-old left his house in a wheelchair. Then ICE agents placed him on a stretcher, marking the beginning of his journey back to Germany to face trial. Pali had received a deportation order 14 years earlier, but stayed in the U.S. until 2018. He became an American citizen in 1957 after lying about his role in Nazi atrocities, only drawing the attention of authorities after finally admitting the truth in 2001. The ailing elderly man died at a nursing home in Germany just a few months after being deported. Bringing alleged Nazi war criminals to justice has become a controversial practice, given their age. But many, if not most, believe that someone who went along with the Germans' horrifying human rights abuses should face accountability for their actions, no matter how old or ailing they are. Number 6. Nuremberg Trials Between 1945 and 1946, authorities brought 21 of the highest-ranking Nazi officials, military members, and collaborators to justice in Nuremberg, Germany. The International Military Tribunal led the trial, a coalition formed by the four main allied nations, including the US, the UK, the Soviet Union, and France. The defendants included former cabinet ministers, economic leaders and planners, military leaders, and others who committed horrifying atrocities during the war. Leading Nazi Party member Rudolf Hess, economic planner Albert Speer, and head of the forced labor program Fritz Salkel were among the accused. Charges included crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and conspiracy to commit these crimes. Prosecutors and defense lawyers argued cases based on British and American law, while high-level advisors tasked a tribunal of judges with deciding cases and imposing sentences. The tribunal found all but three of the defendants guilty. The judges sentenced 12 to death, and the rest received prison sentences ranging from 10 years to life. On October 16, 1946, the court hanged 10 of the convicted. Hitler's designated successor, Hermann Göring, committed suicide the night before by swallowing a cyanide pill. The tribunal held 12 more trials at Nuremberg over the next three years. It tried 185 propagandists, doctors, lawyers, judges, industrialists, and other Nazi collaborators, resulting in eight life in prison terms, 77 other varying prison sentences, and 12 death sentences. Do you think the death sentence for war crimes is justified? Or should these criminals receive a life sentence? Tell me what you think in the comments. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Number 5. Some committed suicide to avoid facing justice. As the Allies advanced on Germany in 1945, some high-ranking Nazi officials decided that suicide was more dignified than being captured and tried as a war criminal. The most famous among them, of course, was Adolf Hitler who retreated into a secret bunker beneath his headquarters in Berlin with his mistress, Eva Braun. In April 1945, they spent their last days in the fully self-sufficient 18-room shelter with their dogs. The couple poisoned the dogs with cyanide before taking it themselves, and Hitler then shot himself. As the Soviets approached, the Nazis cremated their bodies in a hurry. The Soviets took the ashes and moved them from place to place to avoid a memorial being placed in Hitler's honor. 
the Nazis surrendered eight days after his suicide. Joseph Goebbels replaced Hitler as Germany's chancellor following his suicide. Just a day later, he and his wife Magda fatally poisoned their six kids and then killed themselves. Less than a month later, the British arrested Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's right-hand man, who largely orchestrated the plan to exterminate the Jews. By then, officials had stripped Himmler of his authority after he got carried away with his power-obsessed plans to draw the war out as long as possible. The British captured him as he tried sneaking out of Germany dressed as a soldier. He swallowed a cyanide capsule the next day while in custody. Number 4. They became U.S. government employees. Not all Nazis faced certain doom after Germany's surrender. Their valuable skills spared some Nazis from persecution in exchange for their service to the United States as part of a top-secret mission codenamed Operation Paperclip. Between 1945 and 1949, the American government recruited over 1,600 former Nazi scientists, engineers, and technicians for employment in the U.S. The desire to supersede the Soviet Union in the development of military and space technology motivated the project. Recruiters referred largely to a Third Reich catalog of scientists and engineers, known as the Ozenberg List, in deciding who to target. President Harry Truman had approved the operation on the condition that the recruiters would not consider any Nazi members or active supporters. Intelligence officials worked around the provision by erasing evidence of potential war crimes from scientists' records. They justified doing so based on the belief that the recruits had valuable knowledge that would advance America's post-war efforts. Those who supported the operation argued that failing to consider former Nazis for employment could easily tip the balance of power in favor of the Soviet Union. Opponents believed it was simply inexcusable to overlook someone's wartime atrocities based on their talent or intellect, avoiding them to sneak out from underneath accountability for their actions. How do you feel about this arrangement? Let me know in the comments below. Number 3. They went to work for the Soviet Union As the U.S. secretly recruited former Nazi scientists and engineers to work for the government after World War II, the Soviet Union also set its sights on acquiring skilled German experts who could aid in the development of military and space technology. While America extracted its candidates from West Germany, which was occupied by the US, Great Britain, and France after the war, the Soviet Union searched for talent in East Germany. Immediately after the war, Soviet authorities had sent the country's best and brightest rocket scientists to East Germany to learn from the talent there but the government soon became concerned that the Germans would learn too much about what the Soviet Union was up to, so they moved the operations where they could keep a direct eye on things. In a mission codenamed Operation Osovyakim, the Society for the Assistance of Defense, Aircraft and Chemical Construction, the Soviet Army removed over 2,200 German specialists from their homes at gunpoint in the early morning hours of October 22, 1946. The Soviets put them on trains bound for the USSR, where they forced them to assist with the production and design of missiles. Scientists' wives had a choice of whether to stay in Germany or go with their husbands, and authorities gave unmarried couples the same options. Most partners and their children went. The Soviets transported between 6,000 and 7,000 people out of Germany. They also loaded their families' belongings on a trains and took them to the Soviet Union. The Soviets placed top-ranking experts in luxurious mansions and vacation homes. The conditions of the research facilities were less impressive. Scientific equipment that the Soviets transported from Germany ended up being scrapped because of a lack of space for it, and they also lost many blueprints. The Soviets had a high level of distrust for the scientists that they had captured. By 1948, the recruits were receiving assignments that excluded them from knowing too much. Soviet program directors sent most of their scientists back to Germany by 1950. Number 2. They lived normal lives. As someone whose grandparents the Nazis murdered in the Holocaust, British director Lou Collin was curious to find out what happened to former members of the Third Reich. In a documentary released last year called Final Account, he details his mission to track down and interview former medics, SS officers, and concentration camp guards who had evaded both headlines and trials. Authorities allowed these average individuals, who they deemed as functionaries rather than war criminals, to resume their normal lives after the war as if nothing had ever happened. Most of them began their Nazi service as part of the mandatory Jungvolk program for boys aged 10 to 14. For older teens, there was the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls. Some people Holland interviewed explained they didn't agree with Nazi sentiments and they were too young to understand what they were a part of. 
but that they were excited to be part of something that seemed important. This is arguable, considering the overwhelming evidence that the Nazis taught children to hate at a young age. Most of these former participants expressed profound regret over their participation in what they may or may not admit they had a deeper knowledge of. Others were shockingly unremorseful, including an anonymous man who laughed when he recalled calling Bergen-Belsen guards to come and pick up some Jewish prisoners he had caught hiding in his family's pigsties. Former SS Lieutenant Karl Hollander admitted that he still honored Hitler. He said that he didn't believe in murdering Jews, but that he thought that they should have deported them elsewhere. Another SS member denied that six million Jews died in the Holocaust, saying, that's a joke, and it didn't happen. It's both eye-opening and disturbing to learn that after being spared from punishment, many former Nazis still cling to their hateful sentiments. And number one, denazification. After securing their victory, one of the Allies' biggest priorities was to deprogram German and Austrian society from the Nazi ideology. It started with the removal of the Nazi party and SS members from power, along with any organizations that were associated with them. The Allies made an example out of prominent Nazi members and collaborators by bringing them to trial for their war crimes. The control of the German media was one of the major ways the US carried out denazification. They took control of 37 newspapers, six radio stations, hundreds of cinemas, magazines, book dealers, publishers, and printers. Denazification efforts were short-lived as the countries leading the program lost interest in favor of other priorities. The US was focusing on German economic importance and the emerging Cold War with the Soviet Union, causing denazification to be put on the back burner. Both the British and the US handed responsibility for the program over to Germany in 1946. The French, whose version of denazification was mild from the start, abolished the program in 1950. In Soviet-occupied East Germany, denazification efforts focused on removing anti-socialist sediments. Former Nazi Party members arrested collaborators, and a skewed tribunal of mostly socialist judges put them into work camps. The conditions at the camps were deadly, killing between 42,000 and 80,000 prisoners in the handful of years between the end of the war and 1950. Realizing that they had a better chance of survival in West Germany, even if they still faced punishment, many former Nazis defected. Number 11. Châtillon Car Graveyard Legend says that a forest near the Belgian village of Châtillon was once a home to a massive collection of rusting cars left behind by American soldiers at the end of World War II. According to the story, it would have been extremely expensive for the troops to have their vehicles shipped back to the U.S., so they decided to drive them up a hill and into the lush forest and park them neatly in rows. Most of the vehicles have since been removed. There actually used to be four car graveyards in the area, but very little remains today. Anything that was worth taking is gone, and the few cars left are heavily rusted. While the army story seems to be the most popular explanation, there are certain things that don't add up. For one, it seems surprising that if the vehicles were truly left behind by soldiers, not a single one of them seemed to regret leaving their vehicle behind and or coming back to get it. And many locals are quick to point out that a lot of the cars were from after World War II, indicating the site may have just been an ordinary junkyard. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of cars at the site anymore, so it's difficult to learn about the past, leaving more folklore than fact to base our best guesses off of. Number 10. Dubai's Abandoned Supercars it's extremely rare in most places throughout the world to come across an abandoned car that's worth a lot of money. But it became an especially common sight in Dubai after the onset of a global financial crisis known as the Great Recession in 2008. Abandoning a luxury vehicle may seem like an irrational way to handle one's financial problems, but at the time, the country's outdated laws meant that someone could go to prison for an extremely long time for defaulting on a car loan. Many people were unable to keep up with their payments in the struggling economy, so they simply ditched their vehicles. Those who were able to leave the country did to avoid being tracked down and getting locked up behind bars. Lamborghinis, Porsches, Bentleys, Koenigseggs, BMWs, and other high-end cars began turning up outside airports and in parking lots and garages throughout Dubai. Following the onset of the recession, somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 vehicles were abandoned every year in the city. 
The problem eventually got so overwhelming that the authorities realized that the law needed to change. Vehicle owners in Dubai no longer risk going to jail for falling behind on their loan payments. Since the change went into effect, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of cars being abandoned. But there's still an abundance of leftover vehicles from over the years that have accumulated at scrap yards and impound lots. Last year, social media influencer Supercar Blondie uploaded footage of hundreds of dust-covered supercars parked in a scrapyard. Some appeared damaged, but many had no visible defects. Under Dubai's amended laws, a person who abandons their car has six months to pay a fine and retrieve it from the impound lot. Unclaimed vehicles are sold at auction. Number 9. A Deceptive Desertion when a missing woman's car was found abandoned outside a Stanwood, Washington post office in 1993, detectives and her family began to fear the worst. Judith Bellow had recently vanished after she was last seen leaving her job in Stanwood, Washington with a friend. The 28-year-old mother of two never picked her three-year-old son up from daycare or returned home. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Investigators classified Bellow's disappearance as a homicide and continued to look for information about what had happened to her. Her photo was even included in a deck of cards featuring 52 unsolved homicide cases. The case was finally solved in 2011 when the Snohomish County Sheriff's Department received a call from a woman claiming to be Judith Bellow. She said that she was living in Southern California and that she was alive and well. Detectives confirmed the caller's identity as Judith. She had walked away while experiencing domestic issues with her husband, leaving behind her family, home, and car. Judith changed her name and started over in California. By the time she came forward, she had a new family and a whole different life than the one she'd left behind. It was a much different story than her abandoned vehicle had told 18 years earlier. Number 8. Louisville's Impound Crisis In 2004, a man named Anthony Calhoun arrived home and was shot dead while walking from his car to the front door of his Louisville, Kentucky home. Police towed his 1988 Camaro to their impound lot and processed it for evidence. They found nothing useful, and Anthony's killer was never caught. Because the vehicle is considered evidence in an unsolved crime, it's been kept at the lot since 2004, even though it's unlikely that investigators will ever need to re-examine it, whether or not they catch Calhoun's killer. Between situations like this, along with vehicles vehicles that have languished at the impound lot for owners who will probably never come to retrieve them, the city of Louisville is in the throes of an abandoned car crisis. The police lot alone contains around 1,250 cars, including many that have been there for years. The streets are also filled with left-behind vehicles. In many cases, car insurance companies are informed of a wrecked vehicle, but they never come to pick it up because it's cheaper to just leave it at the lot. The city is doing everything in its power to resolve the problem. Earlier this year, anyone who had a car at the lot but didn't want to pay for the towing and fees was given a chance to retrieve their vehicle without penalty. Around 60 cars left the lot that day and another 70 were auctioned off. There are plans to hold more auctions in the future, but it won't get rid of cars fast enough to keep up with the influx of towed vehicles that pour into the lot on a regular basis. But with so much attention being drawn to the issue, the city is finally taking a proactive approach and trying to figure out a solution. Do you think if investigators today took another look at the cars that have been sitting in evidence for quite some time, they could crack some unsolved cases? Let us know in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 7. Dodge Demon and Plymouth Duster the popular YouTube channel Auto Archaeology documents rare, old, and expensive abandoned vehicles, also known as barn finds. A recent video reveals a pair of striking purple cars that, at first glance, look like they could be the same make and model. A closer look identifies the vehicles as a 1971 Dodge Demon and a 1971 Plymouth Duster, which are similar but not exactly alike. Both of the award-winning former show cars had been sitting outside a home in Michigan for over 30 years. There was some mold on the car's interiors, but they were in shock remarkable condition after being neglected for so long. Like any old car that hasn't been maintained or driven in years, they'll undoubtedly need some repairs and restoration. The vehicles are slated to be auctioned off soon at a vintage car and truck sale in Sawyer, Michigan. They're being sold separately, but have spent so much time together, it'd be great if someone bought them both. Number 6. An abandoned garage full of abandoned cars. Last summer, a group of curious teenagers trespassed into a building in the Brazilian city of Rio Grande do Sul and discovered a graveyard of dust covered classic cars. Dating between 1920 and 1970, the collection included a Ford Model T, Citroën DS, Chevrolet Corvair, Fiat 124, Renault Dauphine, and more. There were even more cars on the second floor, including a Chrysler Airflow, a Renault Gordini, several Ford Coupes, and a three wheeled Goliath pickup truck. The teens recorded footage of their discovery 
robbery and sent it to their friends. Someone contacted the police who tracked down the kids' parents and also reached out to the collection's owners. Nobody knew about the cars because they belonged to a private owner who enjoyed them with his friends. He died in the early 2000s, and his heirs couldn't agree on what to do with the cars, so they simply sat collecting dust until last year. The story gained widespread publicity, prompting the owners to start moving the vehicles elsewhere. By the time news of the discovery hit the press, they had already put a Fiat 124 up for sale with an asking price of $12,372, sparking hopes that more of the cars would soon be listed. Number 5. 1953 Pontiac Chieftain an ambitious classic car enthusiast who runs the Budget Builds YouTube channel recently documented his experience working with a 1953 Pontiac Chieftain in Fletcher, North Carolina that had been off the road since 1971. The host, Michael Wagner, filmed his attempt to get the rusting car running for the first time in over 50 years. It's unclear why the car was abandoned. Documents obtained by the channel show that the owner had bought some engine parts in the early 1970s, but for some reason he never got around to fixing it, and it was left to rot for over a half century. The Chieftain was pretty weathered after spending such a long time outside, but Wagner said it had fairly low mileage and pointed out that its pedals were still in good condition. It was equipped with an eight-cylinder engine, which the host and his friend managed to bring back to life. The car didn't run for long, though. Wagner drove it around the block before chunks of rubber began falling off the tires, bringing the vehicle to a stop in the middle of the road. But after going five decades without any care, it's pretty impressive that the pair were able to get it going at all, let alone take it for a short spin. This marked the beginning of the Chieftain's restoration journey, which will be featured in future videos as Wagner continues to work on the vehicle that had seemed so hopeless before it fell into his hands. Number 4. A Moss-Covered Mystery in mid-March, a car veered off a road and rolled down an embankment in Jacksonville, Oregon. Firefighters were perplexed when they saw that the vehicle had landed on top of a much older car that appeared to have been sitting there for a long time. They took to social media for help getting to the bottom of the mystery by sharing a few photos and asking if anyone knew anything about the moss-covered vintage vehicle. One commenter who seemed familiar with the car said that people had called and reported it several times in the past and that it seemed to have been left at the site after an accident that happened long ago. Two other social media users wrote that the car had been there for a long time, but they didn't seem to know anything about it. The post did not identify the vehicle's make, model, or year. At least one person speculated that it was a Chevy Nomad station wagon dating back to some time during the 1950s. Number 3. 1957 Ford Fairlane in 2005, Ron and Elaine McLeod took a trip to see their daughter, who lived in Colorado. She lived next door to an elderly man and helped take care of his property and animals in exchange for a discounted rent. While tending to her work duties one day, the woman found an old car parked in the pole barn. It was covered with a tarp and looked like it had been sitting there for quite some time. Knowing her dad would find the discovery interesting, she showed it to Ron during his visit. He pulled back the tarp to reveal a green, two-toned vintage vehicle, which he identified as a 1957 Ford Fairlane. It only had 43,000 miles on it and it still ran. The owner told Ron that he was good friends with the car's original owner. When the man died, his wife decided that the vehicle belonged with her husband's friend. He moved it to his property in Colorado and kept it in the pole barn ever since, only starting it up every once in a while to move it around a little. Ron's friend was interested in buying the fair lane, but negotiations fell through and the owner couldn't decide whether or not to sell it. As far as anyone knows, it could still be sitting in the barn. Number 2. Dozens of Ford Thunderbirds In 2016, an auction house in Michigan received a truly strange call from a Grand Rapids family who wanted help selling their collection of over 50 classic cars. Scott Medema of RepoCast.com was among the first group that met with the owners at a restaurant before being escorted to the property. Most of the dozens of cars inside the family's barn were Ford Thunderbirds dating between the 1950s and 1970s. There were also some other vehicles including a 1932 Ford Model B and a 1947 Pontiac Converter. The cars hadn't been driven in over 30 years, but appeared to be in great condition. Medema towed the cars one by one to his showroom and put them on display as he prepared to auction them off. He estimated that they had the potential to bring in around half a million dollars. Number 1. Century-Old Antique for reasons that are unclear, a derelict mansion has sat abandoned in the French countryside since 1959. Someone recently ventured onto the property and found a rare 1904 Roche Schneider automobile that had sat in the garage, frozen in time since the homeowners had left. A post by Facebook user Yuri Grosmani offered some rudimentary details about the car, which was manufactured by Paris Van Voren Atelier. Much to the surprise of those who found the 117-year-old vehicle, its four-cylinder engine fired up even after it had spent upwards of six years in the same spot. They were even able to drive it outside and onto the bed of a waiting tow truck. It's currently on display at 
the Remy Champagne Automobile Museum and appears to be mostly in its original condition. Because the car was found so intact, it's hard to say whether it would be better to restore it or leave it as is. Thanks for watching. Which one of these abandoned cars would you be the most excited about if you found it? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.